Additive manufacturing, 3D printing, a technology that allows you to create objects by building them up layer by layer. But what is it anyway? Another fashionable trend with a tricky name? Or something that will turn our lives upside down? Hello Aviator, Sky here, and today we are not flying, but studying how what we fly on and everything else will soon be produced. Moreover, we will study in reality with our eyes and hands at a real object, the Additive Technology Center of the Russian corporation Rostech. Yes, in Moscow. The Additive Technology Center is one of the most advanced enterprises in the country, an integrator of research, development and production in the field of 3D printing. Now their priority areas are the introduction of new solutions in aircraft engine engineering, in energy and in industry as a whole. In itself, it is part of the United Engine Corporation, the same guys that make engines for all Russian aircraft and some non-Russian ones. So 3D printing is most actively mastered by them. And while we are being met and briefed, I can brief you. History. I can't tell you anything without jumping back 100 years. The concept of 3D printing dates back to the early 20th century, but was mostly the stuff of science fiction novels, where special devices built the required objects layer by layer. All this started to become a reality in the 1970s and 80s, when some organizations started creating the first 3D printers. At that time, it was more science than practice. The industry at that time was interested in other innovations, CNC machining, robotic arms and all that. But all of them were just improvements on old methods. Products were made by the same casting, stamping, milling and so on. The idea that they could be grown seemed too advanced. But the technology evolved. 3D printing entered the 21st century in a fairly conscious state. In the late 2000s, the first official standards began to appear, designed to reduce chaos in the industry, when everyone does things their own way and nothing fits together. Now, all methods and technologies have been systematized and described. The first of these documents was called ASTM F2792 Standard Terminology for Additive Manufacturing Technologies. This is how the official name Additive Manufacturing was adopted, although the term 3D printing has of course remained in common use. Otherwise, good luck explaining to the average person what these eggheads are adding to themselves. Additive technologies were immediately adopted in prototyping. It was possible to quickly print a product drawn on a computer and see it in real life, and only then make a full-fledged version. This is much faster and cheaper. At the same time, the threshold of entry, so to speak, remained quite high. 3D printers are complex and demanding things. You need to know how to handle them, set them up and maintain them correctly. The products they produce need to be checked and often additionally processed. These shortcomings did not allow printers to spread everywhere, but they still received a decent audience. Demand generated supply, and simple and affordable models began to appear on the market. This made the industry more widespread and attracted more attention to it, and it became easier to find personnel. There were many people who no longer needed to be explained what it is. But these are all toys. What do the more serious guys have? Let's return to our center, because it perfectly illustrates not amateur, but industrial capabilities of 3D printing. The Additive Technology Center was created recently, in 2018, and now includes a whole building of rather complex equipment, the core of which is, of course, about 43 additive installations of different types. Unlike simple home machines that work mainly with plastics, these things are capable of printing metal products, even with very complex alloys. There are even versions that work with ceramics. That is, they can already make not only prototypes, but also the final product that can be used in practice. Of course, these opportunities came with conditions. The equipment is serious, complex and very expensive. For example, our installations work on two principles. The first is selective laser melting, or SLM, when metal powder is applied layer by layer and the laser melts the chosen areas, forming a solid structure. The second is directed energy deposition, or DED, similar to the 3D printing with plastic, but here the material is also powder, provided through a manipulator, and the laser is again responsible for melting it. As you understand, it would be difficult to organize this at home. 
and the materials themselves are special, specific powders of which there are quite a few types, depending on what they are made of and what for. These powders are often quite expensive, but the advantage is that even in this form, much less material is needed than with conventional production methods, such as milling, when you have a beautiful finished part on the machine, and under the machine lies a mountain of shavings from often a very expensive alloy. And a special additive bonus that promises great prospects. When designing any part, an engineer must always take into account production limitations, so that this part can simply be made. 3D printers allow almost any architecture. Products can be made not modular, but as monoliths, without any welding and fastening, of a very complex shape with cavities and local reinforcements that are more optimal for the entire system. Jewelers were the first to notice this, and they began to make molds for smelting their masterpieces in this way. And then industrial companies realized that the complexity of products is now limited not so much by factory capabilities as by imagination and physics. Oh, how much you can do here! Manufacturers of clothing, footwear and accessories print samples for fashion shows and also develop exclusive markets for individual orders. Poor artists and sculptors are afraid that 3D printers and AI will take all their work away from them. In university labs and classrooms, printers for students are becoming a normal thing. They are also becoming a convenient tool for historians and archaeologists, who have unlimited possibilities in reproducing artifacts. 3D printers are also finding their place in construction. Special models can make both parts of buildings and print entire houses. In the production of electronics, 3D printing is gaining its place. They cannot print processors yet, but with high accuracy they can easily handle boards of complex architecture. Even in food, the technology is already being used. This is of course experimental for now, but a machine capable of printing a cake is not really science fiction anymore. And it would take a long time to describe what 3D printing is capable of in medicine from making implants according to an individual model, to creating entire organs. In the automotive industry, many companies are already printing components for their cars. And here I can describe one drawback of additive technologies specifically in manufacturing. It's difficult for them to get rid of the problem of lack of scaling effect, when with the growth of production volume, the cost decreases. 3D printers print parts the same way, regardless of whether you need 10 parts or 10,000. If you need to print more and faster, you will have to launch more printers, which will not allow you to reduce the cost. In the case of conventional methods, yes, you will have to create a complex machine, which will be expensive. But when launched, it will do a lot, quickly and cheaply. Hello from Chinese factories, supplying you with cool things for $2. Because of this, at the stage of transition from small series to large ones, classical production methods turn out to be more profitable, at least for now. In the automotive industry, for example, 3D printing is actively used by luxury brands, whose final product is a very expensive thing, often created in small batches. If you need to make 100 parts for a Koenigsegg Regira, a printer is the best option. But printing millions of parts for a Toyota Camry is simply unprofitable in today's conditions. And now it's time for our favorite industries, where everything is produced in small batches and is very expensive. Airspace. There's a reason I came running here as soon as I heard about the industrial tour. Space clearly has a special place here, with a lot of unique technology, from rockets to lunar rovers. Here, various organizations, especially private companies, unleash their imagination to the fullest. While some print unusual parts for their products, others print entire rocket engines with a very complex design, and some print entire rocket sections. Modern additive manufacturing has proven very useful in the aviation engine industry. For General Electric, they have become one of the keys to their new generations of engines. Pratt Whitney prints parts for some of their engine models. Rolls-Royce is preparing to print components for its Ultrafans. And in Russia, the United Engine Corporation is actively introducing printed parts into its new models. In fact, their main clients are aviators, followed by the auto industry, oil and gas. In engine manufacturing, printer capabilities are used to the fullest, allowing printing both complex structures, such as fuel nozzles, 
and parts with very high resistance to loads and temperatures, such as high pressure turbines. The same with the formation of monolithic structures instead of modular ones. For example, the guys from General Electric, as an experiment, took one of their helicopter engines and decided to reprint it. So they themselves, without the participation of contractors, replaced 900 internal parts with only 16 monolithic pieces, reducing the weight of the structure by 40%. 40. Yes, this is the engineers playing around, but nevertheless, with the growth of the scale of application, this can affect the aviation industry no less than the introduction of composites. Similar processes are taking place in aircraft production itself. Large manufacturers are actively implementing their own additive technologies. You shouldn't expect that airliners will be printed on 3D printers, but this may well affect components, sections, mechanisms, and spare parts. Oh yeah, spare parts. 3D printing allows you to create parts faster, without having to wait for it to be delivered from a factory. Or if that delivery is difficult or impossible. Maybe you need a part for an airplane that is no longer in production, or a generator for an arctic base, or a mechanism for a space station. And in such responsible industries, the real battle is with another nuance of additive manufacturing. The fact is that all traditional manufacturing methods have been studied in detail, as have the parameters of the products that are created with their help. 3D printing nullifies most of that experience. We know how a cast part behaves, but how will a printed one behave? And what about hardness and elasticity? What about material fatigue? This is why one of the main divisions of the Additive Technology Center, and in general, all their colleagues around the world, is the Measuring Laboratory, which contains a large amount of equipment for conducting research and testing of both initial materials and components of intermediate stages and final products. This includes composition, strength, thermal characteristics, and so on. There is even an X-ray tomograph, a huge one, which allows detecting even the smallest defects in products. To be honest, it is difficult to describe the consequences of the spread of additive manufacturing. It may turn out to be an ordinary trend, which over time will become just another local niche. Or it may begin to grow exponentially, becoming a springboard for a new industrial revolution. For background, a couple of figures. In 2020, the global 3D printing market barely reached $14 billion, and in 2025 it is already $35 billion. Experts predict the $45 billion mark in 2026, and up to 86 by 2030. The mass distribution of additive technologies can seriously affect the very concept of conveyor production. Printers are multi-purpose and can make different products. Today it is a part of the aircraft's landing gear, and tomorrow a bridge mount, which means that they can replace several different lines with one machine. Instead of a huge plant, there can be a small hull with printers. Here we are at the Additive Technology Center, with a decent volume of work and a bunch of competences. And less than 200 people work here. For a manufacturing plant this is nothing. A huge amount of people is simply not needed here. And this is, yes, another stage in the war of jobs and robots. In addition, the technology allows for increased self-sufficiency of production by shortening supply chains and cooperations. In the experiment with reprinting the engine, I said that they redesigned the entire structure without the participation of contractors. What will happen to all those contractors if the technology is brought to serious production and they are simply no longer needed? The same at the level of entire countries that can become more self-sufficient. Why should I buy goods from abroad if I can print them myself? Maybe this is one of the reasons why 3D printing has been ramped up in Russia. It is very much a fashion now. And believe me, such ideas are now floating around not only in Russia. Although a provocative question may arise. One of the most important factors in this technological race is not so much what printers make, but the printers themselves. And quite an impressive race has started here. Leading companies from around the world are investing enormous resources into additive manufacturing, seeing equally enormous potential, even critical in some areas. In Russia, naturally, they're pursuing this issue just as actively and on several fronts, simultaneously ensuring technological sovereignty and development. 
and the ATC, as one of the largest industry centers, plays a critical role here, actively participating in the creation of domestic equipment, their own software, and their own materials. Additive technologies can have an even greater impact on the public segment, on you and me. A person who wants to get some product will not go buy it or order it with delivery, but will download a computer model from the internet and print it at home. And this computer model can be adjusted for you personally. This will allow the scale of customization to be brought to a level that is simply impossible with conventional serial production. Although, there is also a scary nuance. If a person can download a model from an official site and print a beautiful saucepan, what will stop him from downloading a model from a pirate site and printing a weapon? Technological breakthroughs are like that. They ask a lot of questions, to which it is preferable to find answers sooner rather than later. Okay, I'm already describing Star Trek here. Yes, we are still far from all this, but let's be honest, there are no insurmountable barriers in sight. Yes, additive manufacturing has many limitations and disadvantages, but most of them are nothing more than engineering tasks that can be solved, so their development will continue. On the other hand, it is probably good that technology is developing relatively slowly, for now getting a complementary role to other production methods. One can hope that the economy and society will have time to adapt to it. Well, the tour is over for today, and you, lovers of everything unusual and technological, if you suddenly see a part that looks extraterrestrial, don't be scared. It's not alien, it's additive. Fast flights and soft landings to you.